Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with a warm round of applause Professor Dr. Thomas Stocker, University of Bern, and President of the Erschke Center for Climate Change Research, with his keynote speech, High Impact, Low Likelihood Outcomes, Outcomes of Climate Change. Thomas, welcome on stage. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you also for giving a voice to science, because it is science that provides and delivers the numbers on which the urgent appeals of my two speakers before, Alok Sharma and Ambassador David Moran, are based. So let's look at a few numbers and also take a particular look at something that perhaps many of you are not familiar with. Apart from the slow warming and the rising of sea level, there are also other events and outcomes in the climate system. We call them hill events, high impact, low likelihood, or in short, as often used in the media, tipping points in the climate system that need to be considered and that add urgency to the problem. A few numbers to start with. I cannot repeat it often enough. You all know this figure. This is the increase of carbon dioxide in the climate system, in the atmosphere. The most important greenhouse gas of, uh, of, of the atmosphere uh, that has increased by 47% uh, since industrialization. This graph shows the measurements, but our statement rests on a reconstruction, reconstruction using ice cores. You see these um, concentrations increase relentlessly. There is no indication that we have broken the trend yet. And yet that is the goal of the Paris Agreement and all the efforts of the countries uh, 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 in, in association with that. Root cause number two, methane. Concentration of methane since uh, the last two, year, last two uh, millennia has increased by 156% since 1750. Cause of that increase is the food production. These two greenhouse gases and their rapid increases has uh, led to an increase in global mean temperature. Uh, you see here uh, the last 50 years from 1970 to 2020 have been the hottest 50-year period in the last 2,000 years. One result that came out of the latest IPCC report released uh, uh, four weeks ago. So we can clearly speak of global heating and avoid the term global warming, which sort of uh, makes you feel a little bit cozy. It is truly a global heating that we are seeing. 1.1 degrees Celsius since 1900, but if we open up the perspective on the time axis and look at one of the figures that was accepted by 195 countries in consensus in the summary for policymakers of the last IPCC report, then you see that this temperature today is really unprecedented in the last 2,000 years. We can open up the perspective even more and inquire the science and the paleoclimatic archives over the last 60 million years. You see on the top the estimation of the greenhouse gas concentrations from 60 million years to 1 million year uh, before present and below the estimate of the global mean temperature. What Earth has experienced is a constant cooling from times that were really hot about 60 million years ago into the times of the last 800,000 years, which we are very familiar with because these contain the eight, eight ice age cycles that you see in carbon dioxide on the top and in temperature uh, below. Just as a reference, uh, 20,000 years at the last glacial maximum. Here in Bern, we would have our conference below 400 meters of ice from the Aare Glacier that cover much of Switzerland, a climate totally different from today. 
Now let's go into the observational period and also add the projections that were published by IPCC uh, up to the year 2300. And that really gives you the context of the climate change that we are inflicting on Earth, the so-called anthropogenic climate change, which has led to the term of Anthropocene. Humans are leaving a signal in the sedimentary record that our generations uh, after us, uh, thousands of years from now, will be able to detect. So we have changed, really, the system in a considerable way. As you see here, with the most pessimistic scenarios of warming and associated with the inability of replacing fossil fuels by renewables, we will end up in these scenarios that are drawn red. And just to give you an impression on how the world, the surface temperature looks like, this figure, figure number one in the technical summary of the IPCC report 2021, also shows the temperature distributions in the past. 60 million years ago, a hot world. 2020, a moderate world, which we are used to, which our food production depends on, which our livelihood and ecosystems, biodiversity and services all depend on. Compared to the projections, 2100 below a so-called Paris-compatible scenario, 2100 a business-as-usual scenario, a little bit redder, but if you go into the year 2300, you reach colors that are not dissimilar from the colors of the surface 60 million years ago. Adaptation is really a challenge. May I say, it's going to be impossible to adapt to our world uh, similar to that of 60 million years years ago, a change that would have been uh, affected only in about 200 years, a speed of change to which ecosystems surely are unable to adapt. I move forward. You all know this picture, a picture of hope, a historical agreement, now six years old. In this agreement, the countries have agreed in consensus to holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius. And you also know about the more ambitious goal, particularly relevant for island and low-lying states, which are already challenged today by the rise of sea level, to have a more ambitious target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And as a key result out of the science, the statement to achieve these goals, we need to reduce rapidly global carbon dioxide emissions and, in general, greenhouse gas emissions and reach net zero emissions in the second half of the century. That was stated six years ago. It was stated by science already 50 years ago. We knew the facts. But the facts haven't been heard until Paris, where a target has been set down into paper. So Paris is really a unique milestone in our tackling uh, the stewardship of this planet. However, what has happened since Paris? You see the emissions here given in billion tons of carbon dioxide emitted to the atmosphere through the burning of fossil fuel, coal and gas but also cement production and deforestation, you see that curve has gone up with a few wiggles. The latest wiggle has been the COVID wiggle, a reduction of roughly 6%. But I can tell you, this system that you're looking at is more resilient as than the financial sector. Because 2020, 2021, that emission curve will again be up at the level that we are used to and that we must avoid if we take Paris seriously. On this graph, it really looks dramatic and it looks like a big challenge that is ahead of us, reaching net zero, going all the way down in this graph to zero level net zero emissions by 2050. 
Again, let's look at the numbers. These numbers that I will show you really illustrate the urgency in which we find ourselves. I have here on the left the UN target, then the remaining carbon dioxide budget in billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions, the remaining years for that budget to be used up, and the required emission reductions in percent per year. These numbers have been accepted in the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. It was the major achievement of that report in 2013 because the uh, notion of a carbon budget has found fierce resistance with some countries because it really illustrates the amount of task, the nature of the challenge that we are ahead of, and the sheer fact that the amount of carbon dioxide that we are allowed to emit into the atmosphere is intimately linked with the temperature target that we give ourselves. This is really a key point that has now become an established fact. No country uh, doubts that anymore. No country resists that thinking. So at least here, we are all on the same terms. The 1.5 target by now, and these numbers are the actual numbers uh, per 1st of January 2020, the remaining budget is 400 billion tons of carbon dioxide. Um, if you know the emissions globally today, they are 37 gigatons or billion tons of carbon dioxide. We can simply calculate almost in our heads, that 11 years remain until that budget is eaten up at current emission levels. If we say, let's assume and be optimistic, we go down exponentially every year a fraction of emission reduction, how big would that fraction have to be to meet the 1.5 degree target? It would be a whopping reduction of 9% every year. Had I given you these numbers 10 years ago, 20 years ago, these numbers would look much more relaxing. 9% reduction every year, nominally, is probably an impossibility. So therefore, when IPC says um, the 1.5 target is still reachable, you must know that there is a price to pay for that. It's the so-called overshooting. It means that for a few decades, the global mean temperature will actually surpass the declared target of Paris. So we will have warming warmer than 1.5 degrees Celsius for a few decades until the curve dips and comes down. Whether or not we can afford that because we have declared 1.5 is a limit, so let's go a little bit over it and then come back. Whether we can afford it is a question of the resilience of ecosystems and the resilience of the physical climate system, not the least people who bear the consequences for these few decades. Two degrees Celsius, less ambitious, but nevertheless important as sort of a fallback solution, if you wish, firmly ingrained in the Paris Agreement, 1150 million tons of, uh, billion tons of carbon dioxide remaining as of 1st of January 2020, 30 years at current emissions, and then the budget is over, which means then we run over two degrees Celsius, or from today onwards, minus three that looks feasible, but I can tell you it doesn't look feasible in five years from now. It doesn't look feasible in 10 years from now if we have not made use of the 10 years in between. If we wait and see, I can tell you already now from model calculations that in 10 years the two degree target will be as ambitious as the 1.5 degree target today. 
So now let's uh, focus at the remainder of the time on these surprises in the climate system. Already years ago, climate science has pointed to the possibility of surprises. What is a surprise in the climate system? Just one curve here. This is sort of the forcing that we perturb the climate system with. And we're looking at the response of the climate system. And that can come in three different colors. The red color is sort of a comfortable linear change. So however I perturb the system, the system will respond. If I perturb it a little bit stronger, it will respond a little bit stronger. But anything is scalable. That's the red response. There could be a response that is delayed. So for a long time, I don't really notice that something is happening. But all of a sudden, then it starts moving. That's the sky blue curve. That's a delayed response. But there is also the third possibility, which is of concern, and that is the so-called abrupt and non-linear change. That means for some time, the system responds almost linearly, very close to the red curve, but all of a sudden, the system tips. You're reaching a critical threshold beyond which a component in the climate system, and we will see a few examples, may actually tip. And that's the thing that we have to watch. Science has uh, looked at uh, various systems around the globe, uh, the ocean circulation in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, the Amazon rainforest, tropical coral reefs, uh, Indian summer monsoon, the jet stream has come into focus this summer, for example, or the ice sheets over Greenland and Antarctica. All these components or elements have non-linearities, and so in principle they could tip. But I should tell you, science is not yet there to tell you exactly which one tips and when it tips and at what critical threshold we need to be scared. One picture from Greenland a couple of years ago at the uh, terminus of a uh, rapidly discharging ice stream through which a lot of ice from Greenland is melted into the ocean. Just one number to give you here for your memory. Greenland mass loss today, as determined by satellite measurements, is one cubic kilometers of ice every day. One cubic kilometer of ice every day. Antarctica is about a third of that. And that's how it looks in a time series since 2003. Basically, Greenland is on a shrinking path, a heavy diet. You see how this mass, even in an accelerated manner, uh, dips down. That's from satellite measurements, 400 gigatons of ice every year, billion tons of ice. Antarctica as well. The blue curve tells us the surface is not really melting in Antarctica because it's really cold there. But Antarctica is shrinking around the periphery where it's in contact with the warm ocean. The ocean gets warmer, and that signal reaches Antarctica through the ocean route. And that is the purple curve that dips down in a very similar manner as Greenland. Extreme events, another tipping element in the climate system that we have unfortunately and tragically experienced in the last years, in particular summer 2021. The wildfires have been mentioned uh, around the world. You see these yellow areas, uh, both northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. And climate change has come home, if I may say so. It has come home also to the industrialized countries. Canada, northwestern US, Germany, Switzerland. All areas that somehow you have the feeling climate change is something remote. It's uh, perhaps a little bit of warming somewhere. It's the extreme events that really cost us dearly. Remember, Germany with the flooding had, has had to release 30, mil 30 billion euros just to cover the damage and the tragedies of one series of events. If that happens every 10 years, you may be able to cope with it. If it happens every two years, that's a different matter. And that's precisely one message out of the recent IPCC report, figure six of the summary for policymakers. Uh, uh, this bubbly figure uh, should illustrate to you how frequent 
extreme events, here uh, droughts and heat waves become, uh, as time progresses, in uh, business as usual scenarios and Paris compatible scenarios. So we're used to, of these so-called 50-year return period heat waves, to about five heat waves in 50 years. That's uh, the second little panel from the left. If we go to 1.5, that number already doubles in 50 years. If we go to two degrees warming, it triples. And so you see illustrated what uh, David has said, every single half degree counts. Every even tenth of a degree counts. And if we go to business as usual, all the dots, dots, or almost all the dots, have become red, which means the 50-year event, one time in 50 years, has become a new normal. That's certainly what we want to avoid, because already now we know that there are health impacts, increased morbidity and heat-related mortality. A very recent study out of the University of Bern at the Institute of Social and Preventive Medicine has shown that in 43 countries around the world, the um, mortality to heat extremes can be attributed already now to climate change. In many countries, already 40% are attributable to climate change, but in some countries, uh, such as in South America, Central America, and also in the Arabic Peninsula, 60% of the heat-related mortality can be attributed to climate change today. So imagine what that means for the next 50 years or 100 years, in particular if we are unable, if we find ourselves incapable of meeting the Paris targets. Tipping points are controversial in the media. Policymakers are confused about these messages. How serious is it really? Give us a consensus, please. And that consensus for other quantities has actually been delivered through the IPCC. There is consensus about the mean temperature increase. There is consensus about sea level, about precipitation changes. But there is not yet a consensus about these so-called hill events. And that is a proposal that Switzerland will bring before the COP, and that is to commission a special report on climate tipping points for even better stewardship and decision-making in the context of anthropogenic climate change. Let me come to the conclusions. Climate crisis is here. I haven't used the word up to now, but I now say it. The climate crisis is with us. Observed changes are unprecedented in thousands of years. Projected changes exceed adaptation limits. And that is really the, the message. Adaptation will be impossible for many regions of this world if Paris fails. Global and local surprises are a possibility. We know that from the past, so the system has that nonlinearity in itself. Hill outcomes are most relevant for cities, sea level rise, extreme heating, and health impacts. That's going to affect the cities, and cities, as you all know, is the living space of the future. We have megacities that are growing very fast, and we need to keep that on the radar. Comprehensive scientific assessment and their regional impacts, in particular uh, on cities and uh, built space, is missing, and also these uh, events are not yet considered in IPCC scenarios. And the last point I just leave with you because I've made that already. Thank you very much for listening to me. I think cities are important quantities on this planet. Cities have brains, have finances, have innovation. If not cities, who else will start decarbonizing? Thank you very much for your attention.